The way we view the universe has a profound impact on our understanding of ourselves. Today we see the Earth as a small, fragile globe, orbiting at just the right distance from the Sun for life to flourish. It appears to be the only planet with life in the solar system, and the planets themselves are mere specks in the vacuum of space. Human life seems reduced to insignificance when set against the vast, nearly empty spaces of modern astronomy. But before the modern era, the universe appeared much more comfortable and accommodating. Thus medieval European cosmology placed the Earth in the center of a small spherical universe surrounded by the abode of God and the elect. In this study we will explore an early Earth-centered conception of the cosmos from India. This cosmological system is presented in the Bhagavat Purana or Srimad Bhagavatam, one of India's important sacred texts. We begin with a brief outline of this system. First of all, the Bhagavatam describes innumerable universes. Each one is contained in a spherical shell surrounded by layers of elemental matter that mark the boundary between mundane space and the unlimited spiritual world. The region within the shell is called the Brahmanda or Brahma egg. It contains an earth disk called Bhumandala that divides it into an upper heavenly half and a subterranean half filled with amniotic water. The mandala is divided into a series of geographic features called oceans and islands. But these are geometrically perfect rings of cosmic size with no resemblance to irregular earthly continents. In the center of Bumandala is the circular island of Jambudweep with nine subdivisions called Varshas. These include Bharata Varsha, which can be understood in one sense as India, and in another as the total area inhabited by ordinary human beings. Jambudweep is centered on the geometrically shaped Sumeru mountain, which represents the world axis and is surmounted by the city of Brahma, the universal creator. The Bhagavatam says that the sun orbits on its one-wheeled chariot, which rides on Bhumandala. If we take Bhumandala as a literal plane, we see that the sun orbits nearly in this plane. The motion of the sun on its chariot corresponds to what happens in the Arctic during the summer, but it never would be observed at the latitudes of India. The ecliptic projects onto an off-centered circle in the planisphere map, and the sun's position on this map corresponds to the point on the Earth globe where the sun is at the zenith. The terminator, or boundary between day and night, is a great circle on the globe that is perpendicular to the sun's zenith position. It projects stereographically onto a circular arc on the planisphere that rotates once every 24 hours. At the equinoxes, this arc becomes a straight line. At the solstices, it bends so that the north polar region is illuminated in the northern summer or in darkness in northern winter. The passage of day and night is described in the Bhagavatam as a straight terminator rotating over a plain map, as we see here. Here we see the ecliptic and the zodiac projected stereographically onto the earth map. The sun and zodiac revolve clockwise together once per day, while the sun moves counterclockwise around the zodiac once per year. Here the zodiac is projected stereographically onto Bhumandala. Note that as the sun goes around the off-centered zodiac in its yearly orbit, it crosses the ring-shaped islands and oceans of Bhumandala. This ocean-crossing motion is described in the Puranas, and this also adds weight to the planisphere model. Bhumandala can be compared with an astronomical instrument called an astrolabe, which was popular in the Middle Ages. On the astrolabe, the off-centered circle represents the orbit of the sun, the ecliptic. In an astrolabe, the Earth is represented in stereographic projection on a flat plate called the mater. 
the ecliptic circle and important stars are represented on another plate called the Ret. Different planetary orbits could likewise be represented by different plates, and these would be seen projected onto the Earth plate when one looks down on the instrument. The Bhagavatam similarly presents the orbits of the Sun, the Moon, and important stars on a series of planes parallel to Bhumandala. The orbits of the planets are placed on additional parallel planes. Here we see the Bhagavatam's model of the orbits of the Sun, Moon, and 28 important star constellations. These lie in three planes parallel to Bhumandala. The layout is comparable to that of an astrolabe. Seen from the side, we find that the Moon is higher than the Sun, but this is simply an artifact of the astrolabe model. It should not be taken as physical. Seen from above, everything falls into place in projection in an astronomically realistic way. Here is the geocentric system as given by the famous astronomer Tycho Brahe. Note that Brahe has the five traditional planets orbiting the Sun and the Sun orbiting the Earth. In the 19th century, the South Indian scholar Tiruvenkata Ramanuja Jiyarswami compared the solar system with Bhumandala. Here is a diagram of his model. Tiruvenkata's model exactly matches the geocentric model of Tycho Brahe. In fact, this is the natural way to compare Bhumandala with the planetary orbits. In a geocentric model, a planet orbits the Sun, while the Sun orbits the Earth. This produces a looping motion like that produced by a spirograph. In this simple mechanical model, we see the Sun orbiting the Earth in the center and Venus orbiting the Sun. Here we see the orbital track traced out by Venus in its geocentric orbit. Note that it passes from one boundary circle of Bhumandala to another. Here we see the same thing for Mercury. The alignment between the planetary orbit and the circular features of Bhumandala is approximate at 8 miles per yojana. If we choose about 8.5 miles per yojana, it becomes very accurate for all five traditional planets. Here we see the orbit of Mars. This orbital spiral also grazes an inner circle of Bhumandala and an outer circle. The Sun's geocentric orbit is a simple near-circular ellipse that runs down the center of one of the oceans of Bhumandala. The inner planets Mercury, Venus, and Mars are close neighbors of the Sun. For these planets, there is a one-to-one -one match between the six inner and outer boundary curves of their orbits and six bounding circles of Saptadwi, the inner system of seven islands and oceans of Bhumandala. The Sun's orbit provides a seventh circle dividing the six into two symmetric groups. The outer planets Jupiter and Saturn delineate a larger ring of Bhumandala lying outside Saptadweep. Jupiter defines the inner boundary of this ring, and Saturn nearly grazes its outer boundary, known as Loka Loka Mountain. As we mentioned before, this ring mountain is fixed in the Bhagavatam as the outer boundary of the luminaries, and Saturn is the outermost planet visible to the naked eye. The Bhagavatam similarly places 28 constellations called nakshatras in a plane just above the moon. The moon completes one orbit in 27 and a third days, and the nakshatras mark its day-by-day -day motion around the ecliptic. This makes sense in the planisphere interpretation, where the nakshatras serve as a clock face, and the sun, moon, and planets are like the hands of the clock. In addition to the 28 nakshatras, the Bhagavatam mentions a few other stars such as the seven sages defining the Big Dipper. These stars are also placed close to the plane of Bhumandala, and their function is to mark the turning of the Kala Chakra, the Wheel of Time. 
the pole star Druva Loka is mentioned as the fixed center of the time wheel and is placed directly above the seven sages. It is regarded as the abode of Vishnu who controls time while remaining outside of time. There are many cosmological traditions around the world which share important features of Bhagavata cosmology. These include a cosmic axial mountain or pillar which is often identified with a local mountain such as Mount Olympus in Greece. These traditions also include other standard features including those shown in this generic world model. The cosmology of the Bhagavatam and the Puranas is shared in its broad features by Buddhism and it is widespread in the Buddhist countries of Asia. This East Asian picture depicts a square version of Mount Meru and the oceans and islands of Bhumandala surmounted by planetary orbits. This Korean wheel map shows a central continent surrounded by a circular ocean and another circular continent. Joseph Needham in his treatise on Chinese science traces these wheel maps to India or Babylon. Here is a Babylonian wheel map. Wheel maps were also made in medieval Europe. In these Judeo-Christian maps, Jerusalem and the sacred hill called Mount Zion were identified as the world axis. Somehow or other, the tradition of Jambudweep seems to have influenced Gerardus Mercator, who placed a mountain surrounded by a circular continent at the north pole of his map of the Arctic region. The four perpendicular rivers or channels flowing from the central mountain correspond to the four branches of the celestial Ganges flowing from Mount Meru. Here is a Phoenician seal with a personified world mountain and four streams issuing forth at right angles. The Dogon tribe, living near the upper bend of the Niger River, posit a circular continent with a central pillar surmounted by the residence of their high god, Ama. Note the world-girdling serpent in the circular ocean. The ethnologist Evans Wentz identifies this Navajo sand painting as a representation of the four sacred directional mountains of the Navajos. In many traditions, the world mountain is surrounded by four mountains in the cardinal directions. And we also see this in the Bhagavatam and other Puranas. The color scheme is similar to that found in Puranic and Buddhist traditions. The four directional mountains of Jambudweep have four sacred trees on their summits. These include the Jambu tree, after which Jambudweep is named. The theme of a cosmic tree of life is very common, and this tree often grows on the world mountain or stands in place of it. Here we see the Scandinavian tree of life called Yggdrasil. The apocryphal biblical literature describes a tree of life with four rivers of honey, milk, oil, and wine that flow down into Eden. For comparison, the Bhagavatam has rivers of special juices flowing from its four sacred trees. This Assyrian seal shows the tree of life on the world mountain plus two sacred streams. In this East Asian picture, the tree of life stands upon the column of Mount Meru, centered on the ring pattern of Bumandala. The Mayans of Central America have a tree of life that extends through seven heavens, and they also speak of five lower worlds. Rated heavens and underworlds are found in many cosmologies, including that of the Bhagavatam. Here we see the cosmology of the Shipibo tribe of the Peruvian Montea. This includes the tree of life, the circular continent and surrounding ocean, and the world-girdling serpent. The cosmology of the Warao of the Orinoco Delta also features a serpent of being that surrounds their world. Here we see the Norse serpent that surrounds Midgard, the inhabited world of Norse cosmology. The Bhagavatam places a universal serpent called Anantashesha beneath Bumandala. He is generally depicted as supporting the earth from beneath, but the Mahabharata also says that he encircles her in his coils. 
The Bhagavatam places the cities of Brahma and the eight Lokapalas on top of Mount Meru. Similarly, many traditions place the abode of the gods on top of their axial mountain or pillar. Here is the geometric layout of the cities of the eight Lokapalas, or world guardians. These figure in the Vastu Purusha Mandala used to lay out temples in traditional Indian architecture. The grid of the Vastu Purusha Mandala is also associated with the nakshatra constellations marking the ecliptic. Thus the earthly side of a temple was connected with the heavenly realm of the ecliptic. The Bhumandala disk represents the exoteric domains of the earth and planets. In contrast, the cosmic axis extending perpendicular to Bhumandala is filled with esoteric meaning. It represents the path of ascent or descent of the soul. In addition to the orbits of the sun, moon, and planets, there are different worlds or lokas arrayed above Bhumandala along the cosmic axis. These upper worlds can be entered through mystic cities, and they are accessible only to persons of advanced spiritual consciousness. The Bhagavatam describes the vertical dimension of the Brahmanda as a universal form of God, extending from the lowest world at the soles of the feet to the highest at the crown of the head. In this traditional picture, we see the rings of Bhumandala forming the belt of the universal form. Here the positions of the worlds are indicated in relation to the universal form. The levels in the universal form are associated with the spinal chakras on which yogis meditate, and the spine itself is called Meru Danda, after Mount Meru, the cosmic axis. The ascent of the soul through different levels of the Brahmanda is analogous to the ascent of the life force through the chakras in the body. In general, the vertical dimension of the universe represents the path of ascent or descent of the soul through different worlds and different states of consciousness. It lies perpendicular to the plane of Bhumandala, which is the world of the planetary orbits.
the hidden valleys of Tibet and the stunning pyramids of Mexico, to the icy wastes of the Antarctic and the deepest ocean trenches, our search for Atlantis will take us all across the world to seek out ancient clues of a civilization that perished before history had even begun. An object of endless fascination and relentless obsession, it is a quest through time and space to pivotal moments in human history, as well as the dark side of man's longing for perfection. The myth of Atlantis has cast its spell over generations, each trying to find its own unique vision of this lost idyllic paradise. Our journey will take us across oceans and continents and span 10,000 years of human history. A journey to find a magical lost world. For this is Atlantis, the ancient land that legend has it was sunk beneath the waves 11,000 years ago by a massive cataclysm. The story has entranced scientists and scholars for centuries. Atlantis is one of the most fascinating of all historical mysteries. Stories about the disappearance of this legendary island city have echoed down the centuries since it was first written about by the Greek philosopher Plato over 2,000 years ago. But is the drowned city of Atlantis just a myth or is the legend based on a civilization that really did exist? And why are so many of us so keen to believe in it? In the fourth century BC, Athens was a city preeminent in all the world, the very epicenter of classical civilization and a beacon of cultural and artistic excellence that has shone through the ages right down to the present day. And it was here, in the world's first democracy, that philosopher Plato wrote a story, three and a half centuries before the time of Christ, that is the first account of Atlantis in all literature. The fact that Plato originated the story of Atlantis gave it a great amount of weight. Plato was essentially the father of Western philosophy. And because what he had to say was so important and has remained important, it became much more acceptable, much more respectable, if you will, than if someone else had written. Plato tells us that for long ages, the Atlanteans lived at peace with the rest of the world on their beautiful island paradise. Unspoiled by their material possessions and great wealth, they were concerned only with learning, cultivating virtue, and living in harmony with nature. Yet finally this golden age passed and the Atlanteans became like other mortals. Human nature got the upper hand. They became tainted with unrighteous ambition and power. Insatiable for wealth and glory, the Atlanteans pushed forward the bounds of their empire, enslaving all before them. Finally, only one city stood between Atlantis and world domination, Athens. But here at the hands of the Athenians, the armies of Atlantis suffered a crushing defeat for the first time. A defeat that was swiftly followed by a natural disaster that laid waste to most of the world, completely destroying the islands of Atlantis. Violent earthquakes and floods, and in a single day and night of misfortune, the island of Atlantis disappeared in the depths of the sea. And within day and night, both Atlantis and the Athenians who fought the Atlanteans disappear from the face of the earth. The only ones who are left are a few uncultured, as the Egyptians tell Serlan, Athenians who no longer remember the story of their triumph against the foreign invaders. And that's why they have to learn it again from the Egyptians when Solon visits them. 
It was this tragic tale first relayed to Solon in Egypt, which many years later was told at an Athenian dinner party. A story that might have been entirely lost were it not for the uninvited young guest who, it seems, remembered every word. Laid out in a series of concentric circles of land and water. The circle for the Greeks, for Plato in particular, but for the Greeks in general, the circle is a perfect geometrical shape. Circular motion is a perfect kind of motion. By building it in circles, he allows it to manifest the geometrical perfection that he finds the world really exhibits, even if we don't see it every day. In the holiest shrine of the ancient Egyptian capital, Solon was shown records of unsurpassed antiquity, the secrets of a long lost age when a civilization of incomparable power and prestige had dominated the world 9,000 years before, the empire of Atlantis. The description the Egyptian priests gave to Solon of this mighty vanished civilization is the starting point for every search ever undertaken to find Atlantis. A description which Plato says has the great advantage of being a fact and not a fiction. Atlantis was said to lie beyond the pillars of Hercules, outside the Mediterranean Sea, in an ocean we now call the Atlantic. Plato was very, very specific about where Atlantis was and what size it was, and he described it as being larger than the continents of Africa and Asia put together, and he located it very carefully outside the Pillars of Hercules. The Pillars of Hercules are what we know now as the Straits of Gibraltar. And when you locate something outside the Pillars of Hercules, you are locating it in the Atlantic Ocean, just to the west of Spain and North Africa. Atlantis was dominated by a vast, almost perfectly rectangular plain surrounded on three sides by high, very beautiful mountains. Possessed of abundant natural resources, rare plants and precious flowers of every description, even elephants and other exotic animals, Atlantis was a land like no other where the people wanted for nothing. That sacred island, which then beheld the light of the sun, brought forth infinite abundance and the blessings of the earth. Donnelly found evidence of Atlantis having existed in the similarity of plants, animals, and ancient cultures on both sides of the Atlantic Ocean. We find on both sides of the Atlantic precisely the same arts, sciences, religious beliefs, habits, customs, and traditions. It is absurd to say that the people of the two continents arrived separately at precisely the same ends. The pyramids in Mexico were very similar to pyramids in Egypt. The methods of writing, the hieroglyphics, were very similar. So he deduced from that that there must be a common source, which must lie somewhere in between those two continents, therefore in the middle of the Atlantic. But where in the Atlantic might the remains of the lost continent be? Without a doubt, one of the most amazing things that I have ever seen in the bottom of the ocean, and it was while filming for Blue Planet, it was in the Gulf of Mexico. And I noticed there's something out in the distance, couldn't tell exactly what, but it looked like a dark band. And as we approached it, the dark band became a donut. I saw this donut that was black in the center. What the heck is that? And so, as we get closer and closer to it, I noticed that the black band had what appeared to be kind of steam over it. And then I looked, and there was water lapping against the shoreline. This band was a ring of muscles. And inside the ring of muscles was a lake. And it's like, wait a minute. I'm already underwater. And we went out over the water in this lake and tried to descend in it and bounced off and bounced off and bounced off. It was so super saline and dense that the submarine couldn't go down in it. 
We literally bounced off, and as we bounced off, we sent ripples heading back to the shoreline. It was insane. I've never seen anything like it. Tried to be a good boy, but I ain't a boy no more. I've seen some things that a man just can't ignore. And this world gonna see what I'm standing for. And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and separated the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. He inscribes a circle upon the face of the waters. It is I who keep steady the pillars. The world is established, it shall never be moved. Thou didst set the earth on its foundation. He made firm the skies above. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in. The tree grew and became strong and its top reached to the heavens. And it was visible to the end of the whole earth. Where that? Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. Thirteen colon three, and it is he who spread out the earth. Fifteen colon nineteen, and the earth we have spread it out and set thereon firm mountains. 50 colon 7 And the earth we have spread it out, and set thereon mountains standing firm. 79 colon 30 And the earth, moreover, hath he extended. 88 colon 20 And at the earth, how it is spread out. 16 colon 15 And he has set up on the earth mountains standing firm, lest it should shake with you. 21 colon 31 And we have set on the earth mountains standing firm, lest it should shake with them. 31 colon 10 He set on the earth mountains standing firm, lest it should shake with you. 88 colon 18 And the sky, how it is raised high. 79 colon 27 to 28 The heaven on high hath he raised its canopy 